On this episode of Forgotten Rails, the West River Railroad. Railroad fever was infecting the country. Merchants wanted an outlet for their products. That all changed after the turn of the century. Behind me is where one of the worst disasters struck the line. The whole bridge collapsed. And the Connecticut Trolley Museum. We are the nation's oldest incorporated organization dedicated to the preservation of the trolley era. Since railroads were introduced to the United States, thousands of lines have been built. And while some are alive and going strong, others have long since disappeared. I'm your host, Timothy W. Lawrence. Along with my sidekick, Ares the Siberian Husky, we're going to search the nation, exploring and sharing the history of these rails. Whether abandoned, exempt, or currently active, if there's a history, we'll find it. So hop on up, because it's all aboard for Forgotten Rails. The West River Valley of Southern Vermont, with its scenic roads, rolling mountains, and rustic structures offers pure Vermont beauty. As you round the bend on Route 30 in Newfane, your eyes, undoubtedly, will catch the sight of two old abutments in the river. Dozens of motorists drive by every day. But how many people would realize that less than 80 years ago, an active railroad crossed overhead here? In the 1800s, Southern Vermont realized it needed a faster, more efficient mode of transportation. Its answer? A railroad. Fortunes of the West River Valley were improving as after the period after the Civil War. Railroad fever was infecting the country, and the residents of the West River Valley were no different than anybody else. And they, merchants wanted an outlet for their products, and they wanted a way to travel back and forth between the villages along the river and to other parts of the country. Originating in Brattleboro, the railroad followed the Connecticut River one mile north, where it then veered off and followed the West River Valley. It then traveled through Dummerston, Newfane, Townsend, and Jamaica, before arriving here at the South Londonderry Terminal, a total distance of 36 miles. Originally, it was supposed to go from Brattleboro to Londonderry, and then over connect to Whitehall, New York. But funding never came through for all that. There's 1,700 people in this town in 2012, and there was about the same maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less, back in the turn of the century. So it hasn't, and mostly it was because of these people coming uh, up the railroad. That's a good girl. Oh, hi there. When the railroad was completed in 1880, it was claimed that the trip from Brattleboro to South London area would only take two hours. Well, in reality, it was closer to four. It still beat the two-day trek by horse and buggy. Initially, they ran three trains a day, one freight train and two passenger trains, but some of my schedules have shown up to five trains a day. The train schedules tended to follow the rising and falling economy. At the time, of course, there wasn't automobiles, and so a trip to Brattleboro was a pretty major trip, and this just really cut that down. It also helped out with people that wanted to sell goods or receive goods um, outside of the local valley. Whether milk from the company in Brattleboro, local lumber and farm products, or even mail, the railroad was essential to delivering them in a timely manner. Another forgotten aspect of this railroad were the old quarries. In the late 1800s, a handful of quarries formed on Black Mountain in Dummerston. This railroad was the key to shipping granite from these quarries to Brattleboro and the East Coast. Its Dummerston white granite was used in street work, monuments, and structures including such prestigious buildings as the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan. All this granite production brought lots of revenue to the town, state, and railroad. And even when the railroad was on its last leg, the quarry bought the rights to the six miles of track between Brattleboro and Dummerston in order to continue production. Without this railroad, it would have been all but impossible to get the stone from these quarries out. A successful business can adapt to change, but at a certain point, either it becomes redundant 
and it goes away or is success and stays. If you ask somebody back in, like, say, the 1890s, after it's been for 10 years, they wouldn't say, they would say that probably the benefits outweighed the troubles. <laughs> that all changed after the turn of the century, I think. There was a lot of, a lot of derailments. A lot of it had to do with being the narrow gauge and just the terrain, the geography, and the storms, and being close to the river. It had a lot of problems. Behind me is where one of the worst disasters struck the line on August 18th, 1886. As a southbound mixed train crossed the West River, the wooden trestle collapsed, dropping the entire train, including a passenger car, 40 feet to the water below. While the bridge was a total loss, the engine was raised and rebuilt. And by some miracle, only two lives were lost in the end. After the collapse, the railroad upgraded to a steel trestle. In part, this was preparing for the upgrade to standard gauge, which took place in 1905. The conversion to standard gauge allowed them now to avoid having to offload and reload in Brattleboro. With the rails being unified to standard gauge, the trains from the West River Railroad could now continue on any track, rather than having to reload everything onto standard gauge cars. Unfortunately, the, the time period was that the automobile was starting to be pretty widely used. The train was faster than a horse and buggy, but uh, the automobile definitely was faster than, than the train. <laughs> Their timing wasn't great on uh, switching to the standard gauge. Even with the upgrades, there was still a lot of hardship which struck the line. From mudslides and boulders falling onto the tracks, to the flood of 1927, which devastated much of the railroad. The 27 flood basically ended you know, the economic viability of the line. Of course, in 1929, we had the Depression, and at that point, the country slid into the Depression. When the railroad came back in 31, basically, all of the business had evaporated or moved to trucks by that time. Despite trying new renovations, such as the use of a gasoline-powered rail bus, upkeep and a lack of business due to the rise of automobiles ultimately proved to be too much. And in 1936, all except what the quarry now owned was abandoned or scrapped. Even though the railroad has long since been torn up, there are still numerous places remnants can be seen. Even if you're walking through the woods, you may stumble across an old remnant or two. It can really get your imagination going as to what was once there. While a lot of the old line has been converted for other uses such as roads, power line right-of-ways, and trails, other segments have altogether been destroyed. In the late 50s and early 60s, the Army Corps of Engineers came through and built flood control dams along the river. While this was good for public safety, it, unfortunately, destroyed parts of the railroad. Seeing that the river in Townsend and Jamaica provided perfect locations, large dams were built in each town, causing the river to flood out entire villages and the railroad. Despite the fact that large areas have been destroyed, or now lie on private property, one can still make a full day out of hiking the public sections. Out of the original 36 miles, 16 remain as rail trail segments. The first is a three and a half mile long stretch that runs from Brattleboro to Dummerston, Vermont. Parking can be found at the south end off of Spring Tree Road in Brattleboro, and the north end off of Rice Farm Road in Dummerston. This section runs along the West River, cuts through the woods, and shares a power line right-of-way. The next segment is in Townsend, Vermont. Parking can be found at the south end next to the Townsend Lake Dam, and the north end at the parking area along the old Route 30, across from Ritchie's Lane. This segment travels two and a quarter miles along the old Route 30, close to where the railroad once ran. Just be aware that this entire segment rests in a flood zone, meaning that at certain times of year it may be flooded or too dangerous to access. The last segment stretches from Jamaica to South Londonderry, Vermont, some ten and a half miles. And while it is one continuous trail, it can easily be split into sections, depending on how far you'd like to hike. Parking can be found at Jamaica State Park on Salmon Hole Lane in Jamaica, Vermont, Ball Mountain Lake at the end of Ball Mountain Lake Access Road in Jamaica, Vermont, Winhall Brook Camping Area at the end of Winhall Brook Station Road in South Londonderry, Vermont, 
and at the end of West River Street in South Londonderry, Vermont. This segment offers some good sections of railroad bed hiking, along with some adventurous wooded trails, and exciting opportunities such as the switchbacks up and over Ball Mountain Dam, and a tower walk hikers can go out on to enjoy the view of the lake. And if you're truly into it, you can even rent a campsite that rests where the railroad once ran while at Jamaica State Park. And a little added bonus for today. As you're hiking, you may get lucky and see some wildlife. Or... What is this? An anxious pup. <laughs> hmm? I'm 10 feet away from you, love. You're funny. I'd also like to take this moment to mention that some of these places either have an entry fee or rules. And even if the rules aren't something that you'd naturally want to So as I was saying, these places sometimes have rules. And even if they're not what you would naturally choose to do or even want to do, they're there for a reason, and it's important that you follow them. Excuse me, sir, didn't you see the sign? No dogs. Dog? I don't have a dog. What are you talking about? That right there, sir. That's not a dog. This is my baby. Yeah, follow the rules. Another thing to keep in mind before you start hiking the trails is you might want to stop and get some food and water. One of my favorite spots to stop is the Harmonyville store in, you got it, Harmonyville, Vermont. They have good food, good pricing, and they're right across the street from Depot Road, which is home to one of the original station houses. Of the original 10 station houses, six still remain. While some are in their original locations, others have been moved or converted into private residences. The South Londonderry Terminal, however, is still accessible to the public. You know, Aries, for being gone so long, there's still quite a bit of this railroad left. From old bridge abutments to station houses, even this rail trail we're on. To date, there are over 1,700 rail trails in America. How many can you get out and hike? These days, most people take for granted the fact that you can hop on a train and in a matter of minutes or hours, be in a different town, state, or even time zone. But it wasn't always this way. Before there were larger transit systems available, many smaller towns bonded together and built trolley lines. And while most cities and towns have long since done away with their trolley lines and torn up the tracks, or in the case of the Springfield Electric Railway, turned it into a rail trail, you can still find some locations in museums which house these trolleys. Our next stop brings us to the Connecticut Trolley Museum. Located conveniently off of Route 140 in East Windsor, Connecticut, this 17-acre facility boasts some of the greatest trolleys around. In 1940, we became the first uh, incorporated organization in all of the United States to preserve trolleys. That's when the three gentlemen got together and decided that they wanted to preserve the trolley era. Um, so in 1940, they incorporated as the Connecticut Electric Railway Association, and they purchased 17 acres on the main campus here, and then three miles of right-of-way for the very, very low price of $300. Three miles right-of-way that was left open, uh, completely void of anything. The track was gone, the overhead, the poles, everything was all gone. And slowly but surely, um, we've reconstructed a mile and a half so far of that uh, three mile uh, right-of-way purchase. It was a branch line that ran from Warehouse Point uh, to Rockville, Connecticut. Um, and they were able to uh, purchase that right-of-way um, in the hopes of building a uh, museum for, to save trolley cars. Our claim to fame, in a sense, is we are the nation's oldest incorporated organization dedicated to the preservation of the trolley era. Trolley cars are very important to everyday life because back before trolleys ran, the only way you could get around was one, you would either walk or two, you would take a horse car somewhere. Not only did they haul a lot of people, um, but they were also uh, used for uh, funeral processions. They had cars that were specifically designed to carry the mail. Um, they had cars that were designed as jail cars to transport prisoners from place to place. And at one point in time, you could actually travel across the country on the trolley cars. 
and trolleys were really the first mass transit system that could get people around quickly and efficiently. Now, when the early trolley cars were starting to get built, they were uh, fashioned very much after the, the uh, coach cars for steam trains. So they had very ornate designs on them, um, and they were just very, very well done. And I guess this is an excellent example of a car for you to look in for that. If you look at the ceiling in this car, you'll actually notice that the entire thing is stenciled with gold leaf around the outside. You know, this is the most restored car we have in the, in the uh, fleet. And uh, basically every little detail of this car was done to look like it rolled out of the factory. So, you said this one is operational. Yep, this one's That's one of the ones that you can come down and ride um, on a regular basis. Nice, and when it's going down the tracks, do you ever get tempted just to be like, <laughs> Well, I'm uh, not gonna comment on that on film. Before I was able to get my tour guide to incriminate himself, he led me to the next set of cars, starting with number 5645, a 1923 city-style car from Boston. Then on to number 451, a later model urban commuter car. These cars could actually run in multiple units and using this coupler, there's a, a lot of little contacts on it. So you connect the two cars and one controller on the front of this car can run a whole train of the same style car. After number 451, it was over to one of only four Montreal Tramways cars that were ever built. Definitely one of the more unique open air cars around. So they would actually use this to give tours of Montreal and on occasion they would climb Mount Royal with them, um, just giving tours of the city. You'd have a three person crew, uh, motorman, conductor and a tour guide speaking both French and English so everyone could understand. <laughs> we are the only crazy people who run it during the winter uh, for our Winterfest program. Um, I heard Santa Claus appears on it, is that true? He does. This is actually his sleigh, he rents it out. On, <laughs> I knew it. Uh, he doesn't live in the night. North Pole, he lives in Connecticut. That's it. Over the years the trolley cars evolved from a small horse car that usually featured only two axles to a larger trolley, much like what we're sitting on here, it was built in the 1920s, which featured uh, four axles, and the cars became heavier, they became longer, and uh, of course they required electricity. A car of this size couldn't be pulled by one or two horses in the street. To get this electricity, spring-mounted trolley poles would reach up and make direct contact with exposed copper lines carrying 600 volts. 600 volts on that line, copper wire, comes down the pole and it goes down to the motors. The wheels touching the tracks is what grounds the trolley, completing the circuit. The museum also houses a number of stationary trolleys and rail equipment, ranging from an 1895 model that ran on the Five Mile Beach Electric Railway, to later model high-speed cars, cabooses, old engines, a pump car, and even... <laughs> I, <think. laughs> I love this! That is called a Velocipede. Um, those were built in the mid to late 1800s uh, as track inspection vehicles. Track inspector or not, I thought it was pretty cool. So when I run away, I'm gonna grab one of these things and just travel the rails on my own. Yeah, just be careful, oh, you know, the train's not coming. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> in addition to the trolley cars, we actually have a little known secret here. We have an antique fire truck museum. Also, we have um, a bus museum, and that's included with your admission. And how about a little music as you look around? That's right, there's even a player piano. With admission at only $8.50 for adults and $5.50 for children, having a great day won't break the bank. On this day, my tour ended at what turned out to be my favorite trolley the museum has to offer. All right, well, next up we have car number 16 right here. This is from Springfield, Vermont. Uh, it ran for the Springfield Electric and then the Springfield Terminal Railway. Now they used to call that line the Tunerville, right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they converted that into a rail trail recently. Oh yeah? Yeah, that's pretty cool. I go out with my dog all the time. I had no idea that they still had equipment from it. Well see, this is actually here and you can ride it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you wanna go? I'd love to. All right. Let's not forget, included in your admission is unlimited trolley rides for the day on any number of their operational cars. Traveling a three-mile round-trip route along a segment of the former Hartford and Springfield Street Railway, riders can enjoy the sights and sounds of a fully restored trolley car. Looking for a little more adventure? For only 55 bucks and a quick operations course, you too can even drive one of these trolleys. Never would I have thought I'd be operating a piece of history.
doesn't get much cooler than this. Hey, do these tracks lead to the land of make believe? They do. <laughs> well, girl, they didn't lead to the land of make believe, but it was a really great experience. One that anyone who has the ability should definitely try for themselves. Have a railroad you think should be highlighted on a future episode? Drop us a line at ForgottenRails at imrfilms.com and who knows, maybe we'll come and visit you.